So, hi there. Good morning, everyone. Everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, the second in a series of lectures about designing. And my name is still Karel Gelderblom. Now, today we have a very special theme running. And it is art theory being like a box of candy for the designer. So we are going to discuss artistic research today and what could be the importance of that? Well, I would like to start with a statement and also an answer to that question. Uh, the statement is the first idea might not necessarily be the best idea. Now take for instance a graphic designer. If you don't know a graphic designer, you can easily recognize them. They always carry large headphones. They wear skinny jeans and sneakers, and they always have something with Apple and they wear black rimmed glasses. Well, if you come across one, you will know that at one point in their career, they are going to have to design a logo. Now, logo designing is very delicate stuff. Why is that? Well, a logo um, is the representation of, let's say, the core identity of, let's say, a business. And you may understand that it is quite difficult to have in one first drawing the, let's call it, DNA captured. Um, so you see there is a bit of a path to go before you actually reach to the core of that. Now, for instance, here, the logo for the New York Public Library. Um, obviously, they have a statue standing outside and you see um, all these different stages and all these little details that are altered in order to get the, 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 the real DNA of what you are looking for and as well in this design for the uh, Pennsylvania Penguins. It's apparently an ice hockey team. And look at the very minute way <coughs> the um, graphic designer has done research in the effect of just twisting and turning. OK, um, this may be explosive material for some of you because some of you are used to have a first idea when they get an assignment and hand that in and make sketches afterwards. But no, um, I have to say that even the uh, most iconic designs were developed through trial and error. When it came time to design the Snow White character, each of the animators had his own unique vision of the girl. Snow White was a major problem. I mean, they started out with drawings that were quite caricatured. Uh, some of them looked like Betty Boop. Some of them looked like Zazu Pitts. Um, there was a, a great range of cartoony heroines, but um, eventually the drawing became again more naturalistic and this was due to the fine draftsman that they brought into the studio. Snow White is a, a successful design for the type of film that Walt wanted and that was a very innocent, pure heroine. And there was a struggle to do it at the studio. I'm Snow White. Snow White, the princess. Okay, and the second example is uh, this uh, iconic Dutch design example. It's called the red and blue chair created by furniture designer Gerrit Rietveld. Now Gerrit joined a group uh, that was founded in 1917 and it is called The Style and you may not have heard about the group but you certainly will recognize uh, the work of the artist in the background. That's of course Pete Mondrian, who was a member of the style group. Well, Gerrit joined them in 1919, and then he started to change his designs into, well, a quest for uh, clarity and honesty in his designs. Now, the first prototype that you see here has got these uh, sideburns. Um, in Dutch, we call them bokkebaarden, which is a wonderful word. Uh, and I don't know why he, 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 he uses them, because in the second prototype and in the third he still has them and maybe it is because it's something to do with the construction but in the fourth prototype he loses them and then the actual shape takes place uh, then in the fifth prototype type he starts adding color and then only in 1923 we see the iconic chair, the iconic red and blue chair with the colors that refer to Piet Mondrian. Now, um, Gerrit was really ahead of his time. Uh, for instance, look at this comparison between what is 
the usual chair in a household in 1920 and the Gerrit Rietveld design you can see that uh, well people ordinary people were not really ready for a design like this but it was Gerrit's dream to design for ordinary people and to make um, responsible design available for people with less money than the elite um, he tried to do so by showing the construction you can see that you can that it's easily to see how the chair is built and how easy it is to build this chair thus becoming very cheap and he went further because he tried to um, design uh, his furniture uh, in a way that you would have little waste material and look at these models you see they are about three centimeters that's one and a half inches high at all and um, they are uh, designed on a flat piece of paper and if you fold them they fold like this piece of furniture now he wanted machines to do that but again Gerrit was a bit too far ahead of his time and machines were not capable of uh, performing this technique yet but you can easily see that um, it's wonderfully uh, constructed and um, what I want you to point at as well is that for your portfolio sketches are important but do not forget that 3d sketches like these these little uh, 3d models that you can make out of paper or cardboard add a, a, a complete new range to your portfolio so don't forget sketching in 3d as well okay now you can see artistic research as a quest where you investigate the possibilities of your idea and you try to boldly go where no man has gone before Well, and let's meet one of those true adventurers. Uh, this is Levi von Velu. He was born in 1985 and studied at the Academy of Artes in Arnhem, which is in the center of the Netherlands. Now, Levi had two passions, that's drawing and photography, and he tried to combine them. His uh, research was about um, what kind of effect does it have when you make drawings on human skin? And, uh, well, he states that he was a bit lazy, actually, because he should have uh, had a model composing for, for him. But but he, he didn't want to bother with that because he says, um, well, I had to sit and wait around until the model arrived and then I had to pay uh, him or her. So, so this was not really a good plan for me. So I start using my own body as a canvas. Right. But he was very disappointed when the first... Um, works came out why was that why was he disappointed well it was too much of a self-portrait it was too much levy with a ballpoint um, drawing on him and so he moved on and he tried to sort of get his identity from the picture but he did not succeed and this is where we get to a point where we already spoke about in the last uh, in the previous lesson we had and that is when your idea is not working um, you have to let it go you have to look at what is happening in your work and res uh, respond to that and here you see already the next step um, he's clearly unhappy <laughs> and um, with the drawing of hair the next step obviously is letting go of drawing and stepping over to the hair well what you see is that he succeeds now in uh, not being levy anymore he's anonymous it is about the body as a canvas and so he moves on and on with the hair until he gets a point where he's done everything with the hair and he gets no further so he steps to the next stage and that is just using other materials now the one on the right hand side is really interesting Levy at that time had in his studio a filthy gray old stained carpet and he wanted to get rid of it and he was looking at it and he thought oh that's maybe interesting because now it's sort of useless and um, I want to throw it out uh, but maybe I can rehabilitate it maybe I can give it um, a second life so he cut it out and he used it in the way you see in the picture and I think it's a marvelous attempt because um, well the light uh, that that falls in the 
in in the eye part is 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 really mysterious and um it's wonderful that you can give material that you that was on its way to the bin <laughs> give a second life maybe eternity i don't know uh next step is the background uh, levy is going to combine the background and is moving on what he does here is he builds a set in his studio and wears a bodysuit bodysuit uh, with uh, these a uh, bit of wood attached to to them and um well it's it's meticulously uh, done he's uh, really a control freak and then a second change had to be made and this is a sacrifice too because i told you he liked drawing he liked photography but he moved on to video and it was the moment that he got discovered uh, this um, bit of footage uh, came on the internet and it went viral and so Levy got uh, a sort of celebrity but he didn't want that at all because this was just okay one of his tries one of his attempts he moves on and this is a very impressive bit of work because it starts as a picture but look very good his chest is moving um, he discovered something in his quest which is quite remarkable he wasn't looking for that at all and that's the serendipity that we were talking about um, well, he made this set with 30,000 balls attached to the wall, attached to his suit. And it is a, a video about him in his uh, boys' room, his, the, the, the chamber he had as a child with his parents. And you see, he's not really sort of happy here. And he found out in this project that um, he, he was always trying to get control uh, over things. And he uh, sort of figured out that that was because his upbringing was really hippie like there was no structure in the family there was no bedtime there were no rules you could do anything you wanted and in his later life he found that he was always looking for structure and always trying to get control but the hardest thing he says is to uh, control these balls uh, and attach them to the surface and the harder it gets to have control the more interesting and the more persistent i get to succeed uh really really wonderful now what you see here looks like digital work like it's made on the computer but it's not it's, everything is built in his studio and everything is real life hands on and he knew then that his um, project had ended the the last one he did is the video of his mother and father sister and brother together at the table and you see again um no one is talking there's no contact no communication so it's a sort of reference to his childhood and he wasn't even looking for that he was looking for what does um drawing do on human skin and this is where it uh, where it ended okay um he said well it's time to go back to my source i like drawing so he picked up drawing again but in a couple of weeks even he stepped on to again a video about storage racks that are neatly uh, posed in a very dark uh, and mysterious room and then all falling over creating a immense chaos okay so that's uh that's levy van velu for you and so now it is time for our first candy commercial break For favorite color, Cadbury Gems, Raho, Umarless. So I already have some tips for you this morning. You know, these lectures we have are uh, to uh, help you composing your portfolio and make your portfolio uh, interesting. And the first tip I have for you is diversity. So it would be nice in your portfolio to present work in uh, a variation of crafts, in a variation of 
disciplines. Now, uh, the first uh, artist I would like to introduce to you uh, concerning diversity is our own Rotterdam-based artist, uh, Deborah van der Schaaf. Uh, she studied illustration at the Willem de Koning Academy here in Rotterdam. And when you think about an illustrator, you think about a designer using brushes, pencils, markers, and yes, Deborah does all that, but that's not all. Because Deborah decides what tool she's going to use according to the assignment she gets. So, for instance, for a, an illustration for a Dutch newspaper, uh, an article about aromatic spices in the kitchen, she used the spices as a sort of paint, as you can see. So this is the illustration made of spices themselves. And the next thing she, she, she did for food, uh, for a food magazine, um, Elle magazine, she made a collage. And if you look closely at the back, you can see a picture of a lady behind a plate uh, taking a spoon to her, her mouth. So she differs all the time. Then she took up knitting because she needed a cover for a magazine with a theme about nostalgia for craftsmanship. Uh, and this one I want you to have a close look at because this is sort of revealing the way she works. She works together with a photographer and there you go. An illustrator does not necessarily need to make everything with a pencil or a brush. So what does she, she do in this particular case? Uh, Parole is, a, is a, a, a newspaper as well, I needed a cover for a, a magazine special about spring. Now, the daffodils are, of course, symbolic for spring, but also in the Netherlands, they used to clean their house completely when spring came. So spring cleaning. Um, what she done is really clever. She took a real broom and she sort of put the daffodils on top of the bottom end, uh, the bottom end keeping its stiffness because it's covered with the de daffodils. But um, the, the really hard thing is to fold these electrical wires around it so the daffodils keep in place. Uh, making a phot photograph of it, making it an illustration suitable for the cover of a magazine. Uh, this one I think she did not do in her studio, but um, with Photoshop because I think it never would uh, stand up. Uh, the, the title of the book uh, cover and the title of the book is The Miracle That Doesn't Fall Over. And this is what she did in her own freezer back home. Uh, she cut up a flower, put it in her freezer, took it out and uh, made a picture of it and thus making it an illustration for an article about decreasing fertility. Um, this one is nice as well. Um, this is uh, the television magazine of a broadcasting company uh, that had a theme apparently about the um, the uh, goodbye to cable television, and she used the cable as you would with a pencil. So so creating the line with it. Now Deborah came to my attention because of uh, one of the covers she made for that same broadcasting company. The company uh, had developed a series about a famous Dutch writer and they were to follow him uh, a whole year round in his kitchen garden. Now, I don't think that's very sexy television, watching an old man a year round weeding and uh, sowing and digging in the ground. But anyway, uh, that's apparently what they call slow TV. And, and well, um, they wanted to ha have the audience uh, notified that the series was on. Now, nine out of ten, nine out of ten designers would um, take a picture of the guy in his glass house with a hat on and a couple of garden tools in his hands, uh, just exactly like you see here. But not Deborah, no. Deborah, she um, remembered something that uh, I think all kids in primary school do, and that's creating a Craftsman. Now, what what you get when you're in primary school, you get a toilet roll, you fill it with dirt after you painted a happy face on it, and then you sew this crest seeds in, in it, and within three days you get your results. So what did Deborah do? It was about a kitchen garden. It was about sewing. It was about growing. So she put, say, she got out a box, filled it with dirt, and sew the seeds of crest in it in the shape of Martin's head. Now the really nice 
detail about this uh, cover is the little uh, plates you see, the little um, thingy, plastic thingy you see that you use when you sow seeds and you do not remember where you put what, so you can remember what you put where. Anyway, anyway um, the first uh, attempt um, got wrong. She, she, the seeds did not rise. Uh, so any other um designer like me for instance would say well okay this is it i'm i'm it's a rubbish idea anyway i'm going to do something else but not deborah no uh she tried again and the second time um she succeeded now i suspect her of something really special that she 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 had it in a box so it was quite movable now if you project um, the face of Martin on it, you can see the details. And what she did was she um, she painted with dark green paint the details in it to have the uh, resemblance of Martin's, fa Martin's face uh, on it. Wonderful stuff there by Deborah van der Schaaf. Now, the next one is about variety. And maybe you remember last week's Philip Ackermann, the guy that... Um, only painted himself and uh, still is at it uh, over 30 years now and um, what was really um, remarkable was the fact that after 10 years he he did away with his mirror and he painted uh, well his inside his inner landscape you may say and you saw as well the humongous fire variety he created in doing so. Now I have um, an example of another artist. I bumped into the work at the Biennale in Venice a couple of years ago and well the subject is, is maybe not too cheerful but the way that she investigates um, what works best is very interesting. Now I'm going to show a couple of them to you and you can see that she's sort of uh, trying from all angles, zooming in, zooming out, uh, taking different stances, um, adding sometimes colors. He, he, he can see that she takes a different stance, um, turning it, flipping it, um, adding certain colors, skipping it, and so on and so on. You see here, it's um, an, an attempt to, to sort of make, uh, um, sort of research what works best. Okay, now you should remember that because this way of working uh, really pays off for your own portfolio. Uh, what you're looking at now is one of my favorite sub subjects and that's a supermarket trolley. Now a supermarket trolley is usually found in flocks nearby a supermarket on a parking lot some, something. But um, sometimes you see them standing on their own and that's not a very good sign because shopping trolleys do not belong uh, to be alone. They will end up in the canal or something like that, or maybe a hip designer will take it home and attack it with its torch and then make a variation of all these nice supermarket market trolley uh, settees, as you can see them. And uh, the next tip I have is uh, about being unconventional or at least trying to be unconventional. What I mean with that is that you sort of have must have the courage to leave what you already know and step into something that you do not know, which is always a bit scary. Now, the word that I actually meant, um, well, I couldn't find it because we have a word in Dutch that, that that's really nice. And I, especially if you're from a broad, you should notice this word and, and, and try to put it in your heart. And the word is onbevangen. And it's not translatable, actually, because onbevangen is an, an attitude word. And it means a lot of things. It means that you are courageous and it means that you're unprejudiced and it means that you're uh, not in fear of the unknown and that you have uh, the spontaneity of a child. Now, this is wonderful. This is all in one word. Now, um, if there's one word you should keep in your heart, then it is onbevangen. Now, let's have a look at what you can do with this tip. And, um, oh, sorry. The first one I would like to um, introduce you to is, is um, try to work quickly. Now, I know that there are perfectionists amongst us today. 
<laughs> I think I see you smile through the screen. Um, if you're a perfectionist, this is going to be a very hard one, but a very interesting one. Now, you know, when you're a perfectionist, you are never satisfied with what you do. Uh, in order to get, a qu uh, get used to working uh, at a, a higher speed, you should uh, set an alarm clock at one minute. Take a subject like, for instance, the skulls you saw, and then um, start drawing, start painting, one minute, and when your timer goes off, just stop it. Stop drawing, take the next sheet out, and set your timer again. And again, go for one minute, and then when the timer goes, stop, and again, and again, and again, and within the hour, you have a pile which is which are very nice because you did not have the uh, the time to be perfectionist about uh, it, and um, you can make a nice sharp selection out of the pile. Anyway, this is the way that Erwin Worm works. He's an Austrian artist, and uh, you don't need uh, expensive materials. You can just use anything that you see around you. Like, for instance, Ton Zwerver from Amsterdam, who makes these hand sculptures. They are really funny. And you see that the only thing you have to do is, is stop thinking uh, conventionally. Like, okay, the, the, uh, you always have to pick up a, a, a pencil. No, you don't. You can uh, pick up a pile of memos here and uh, make a wonderful sculpture. Or your shopping bag, put it on the ground, give it a couple of hard kicks, and it changes all the time. So you have a moving everyday sculpture. And when your parents leave, uh, you can rebuild the living room with the series of living room sculptures, also by Ton Zwerver. Wouldn't it be nice after a stroll, your parents came back into their living room and they find this wonderful Greek temple made of their books. Okay, um, another one that has to do with being unconventional unconventional, unbevangen, is uh, to do the opposite. Be a bit rebellious. Um, uh, well, rebellious uh, certainly is Martin Baas. He, at this moment, is a very well-known Dutch designer. And already, when he um, finished his studies at the Dutch Design Academy, uh, he was noticed. Why? Well, <laughs> because he set a light to design icons. Now, this is may sound as a barbaric act, but actually uh, really interesting. He said that uh, in art theory class, he got bothered, he got irritated by all these wonderful uh, designs by uh, previous designers. And um, well, they sort of spoiled it for him. And what he did was he said light to these icons, but then again, he realized that um, these design icons had also um, sort of cleared the path for him as a young designer. So in one way, he was uh, irritated, and in the other way, he was indebted, as they say. So what he did was really nice. He did not incinerate them completely, but he put out the fire at a certain point, and you can see the result here, and then covering them in acrylic raisin. And that's the same stuff you saw last week uh, when we saw the work of Ted Noten. There was the jeweler designer who picked up this mouse and, and put it in acrylic raisin and to, to make a piece of jewelry. Well, um, actually, when you, when you cover this chair, a chair by, uh, of course, um, Gerrit Rietveld, uh, you can use it. You can put it in your living room and you have a sort of, let's say, uh, a remake of a Gerrit Rietveld chair. OK, so this was the first thing Martin did. Now, another example of doing the opposite is that he chose a material that is, well, rather neglected when you go and do furniture design. Why? Well, because it has the character not to be very useful and it's clay. Well, in this particular case, he used synthetic clay and the, the core is a skeleton of iron. Well, as soon as he had made it, uh, well, it got famous and uh, within <laughs> just a couple of years, uh, it was shown at the Stedelijk Museum. So, okay, well, this really uh, means that you have touched something there. Okay, so here you have them. They're really nice. Okay, uh, so I'd like to recapture. Uh, I hope you uh, have uh, some use or can put uh, the tips to some use today. Um, explore your idea by making variations, 
You can do that in zooming, tilting, stance, color, monochrome, uh, and so on and so on. And you know, I think this is not only for this course, but for the rest of your entire life. Be brave <laughs> and have the guts to use unusual materials or disciplines you are not familiar with and dare to change your pace in working like the speed thing I told you about. Well, it's always nice to collect images that you find uh, intriguing or helpful and to enhance your research. Well, for today, our uh, candy box closes. Uh, I'm very sorry. And I hope you have a very fruitful day and bye bye.